Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Please have a seat. Hi, everyone. Um, well, let me start by saying it is so good to be with our Attorney General, Merrick Garland, our Surgeon General, Vivek Murthy, and um, Gender Policy Council, where is she? Director Jennifer Klein, um, and all the members of the task force. Thank you all for the work you do, for the extraordinary work that you do. Um, Sloan, thank you for your courage. Uh, it takes a lot to put yourself out there as a public figure, period, but then to speak out about um, something so many people regardless of gender, are experiencing. So thank you for your leadership. Thank you. And to all the other survivors who are here today, um, you motivate us, you inspire us, and you are the voice of so many people who are in this room because of the voice that you express around these issues. And so I thank you for that and your strength and your sense of purpose. Um, and in particular, I also want to acknowledge Matthew and Francesca. So I know it is not easy to talk about what you've experienced. And um, I, as all of you know, most of my career I spent it as a prosecutor. And um, the majority of that time I was focused on crimes affecting women and children, um, crimes that involved sexual abuse. And, um, and in many of the cases, in particular when they were um, going to trial and we were prepared to go to trial, um, I'd sit down for extensive periods of time to talk with uh, the survivors about their case and talk with them about what it would be like when they were going to walk out of my office and walk down the hall and, and walk into a courtroom. And for some, as you all know, it was impossible to imagine what it would mean to speak publicly about what they'd been through when, you know, most don't want to even speak about it in private. Um, but every time, I have to tell you, I was inspired by their bravery for so many reasons, both because of the courage it takes to tell a story that is a story that is informed by some of the most horrible experiences, but also informed by such pain. Um, but I was also inspired because, again, the courage that it takes to be that voice. You know, when, when I would prosecute a case, and the prosecutors here know that, um, it was the, 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 I would stand in front of the, the jury and I would say Kamala Harris for the people. And the charging document would not be the name of the victim or survivor versus the defendant. It was the people versus. Because you see, in our form of justice, we have rightly said that individual should not be made to fight alone. A harm against her, against him, against them, is a harm against all of us as a society. And so it is with that spirit that we are doing the work we are doing today to convene and to inaugurate this task force. Understanding this affects all of us if it affects any one of us. And we, therefore, all of us, have a responsibility to stand together to support those who have gone through this, but to also recognize they shouldn't have to be alone fighting on this issue. So that's the spirit with which we convene today and the spirit with which we are doing this work. And um, I will tell you, as Attorney General, many of you know when I was in California, I prosecuted the first case in the country of an operator of a cyber exploitation website. And I'll never forget, you know, my office was mostly in Sacramento and we were dealing with a case, if you know, California in another part of the state. And I flew down to meet with the person who was actually handling the case to go, I went through the files to see where were we, what was going on, what were we going to do about this case? Because it was, in many ways, a case of first impression, although it wasn't when we thought about the pathology of what was at play, when we thought about the, you know, we call it the MO, modus operandi, right? When we talked about and thought about how it was being done, what was motivating it, and how it was making that victim and that survivor feel. So, yes, it was the first in the nation, but we'd seen that kind of stuff before. The point was that we needed to update and upgrade ourselves as law enforcement and as the criminal justice system, as a justice system, to recognize where it is now occurring and update our approach to deal with it 
in all places where it exists in a way that causes harm and pain and injury. And so that website in particular, it, what it did is it let people upload sexually explicit photographs of their former partners, the, the photographs that were taken and shared in, with consent in a consensual relationship. But of course, what ended up happening is that one of those partners, usually in that relationship, um, had, a, had a grudge or an issue or a motivation to embarrass or to harm and would allow the photograph to be posted with the explicit intent, certainly with the implicit effect of trying to embarrass and degrade and hurt and cause pain and attract judgment to that individual. Well, in that case, I'm happy to report that the person who ran that website went to prison because I do believe that there should be consequence for behaviors that harm other human beings. Um, but this kind of justice is still so rare because many of our laws have not caught up with the advances in technology. So as a United States Senator, I introduced legislation to make these acts a federal crime. And thanks to the recent, and our president, Joe Biden, and the recent reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act, for the first time, cyber exploitation victims can sue their abusers in federal civil court. And this is progress. Yet, we still have so much more work to do to protect people from online harassment and abuse, which is why the work of this task force is so important. Context. Well, the internet is an essential part of life in the 21st century. Can't get around it. Can't get around without it. And for far too many people, and Sloan told her story, the internet is a place of fear. One in three women under the age of 35 report being sexually harassed online. Over half of the LGBTQ plus people in our country are survivors of severe harassment. Nearly one in four Asian Americans report being called an offensive name, usually motivated by racism, being called an offensive name online. And black people who have been harassed online in our country are three times more likely to be targeted, again, because of their race. No one should have to endure abuse just because they are attempting to participate in society. Of course, the impact of this abuse extends beyond the ability to use internet, the internet system and the power of the internet without fear. It's beyond that. In many cases, cyber stalking have serious mental health consequences for its victims, sometimes leading to self-harm, sometimes leading to suicide. And we continue to see how some acts of mass violence, the most recent included, have followed expressions of online hate and abuse. The white supremacist who murdered 10 black people in Buffalo, New York, was first radicalized by all accounts online. And after the massacre of 19 children, of 19 babies, and two teachers, in Uvalde, it was revealed that the shooter had threatened to kidnap, rape, and kill teenage girls on Instagram. One of the girls he harassed described the abuse, I quote, as just how online is. Think about that. Hate has become so common on the internet that as a society, it's kind of becoming normalized. And for users, some might say unavoidable. Recent events have all
Thank you, Madam Vice President, for convening this important meeting and for telling me where to stand. <laughs> Thanks to Sloan Stevens, Matthew Herrick, Francesca Rossi, Marianne Franks, Carrie Goldberg, and Melissa Diaz for being with us today to share your experiences and your recommendations, which I know will inform our work in the days ahead. Online criminal harassment and abuse are serious offenses. They are easy to commit and often difficult to investigate. And they inflict devastating and long-lasting harm on victims who are disproportionately women, children and young adults, and members of the LGBTQ plus community. Preventing and addressing online criminal harassment and abuse requires a whole of government approach. And that is why the Department of Justice is eager to take place to take its role, take part in the critical work of this task force. Today, I'd like to briefly outline three areas of focus for the Justice Department. First, we are expanding our capacity to prevent online criminal harassment and abuse. Our Office of Violence Against Women is using every resource at its disposal to combat cyber stalking and mis misuse of technology by abusers, including through its stalking Prevention, Awareness, and Resource Center, which provides education and training at the local, regional, statewide, and national levels. OVW has also funded important work that is underway to collect nationally representative data on cyber stalking in the United States. This data will help us assess the scope and the nature of these crimes, as well as determine survivors' access to services and any unmet needs. We look forward to sharing the report and its findings, which will be published later this year. In addition, thanks to the 2020 VAWA reauthorization, the department has begun work to establish and maintain a national resource center on cyber crimes against individuals, which will provide resources, training, and technical assistance to prevent, enforce, and prosecute cyber crimes against individuals. Those cyber crimes include the use of technology to harass, threaten, stalk, and extort, as well as the non-consensual distribution of intimate images. The department has also requested $10 million for grant programs authorized under VAWA for states, Indian tribes, and local governments to step up their own efforts to prevent and respond to cyber crimes. Second, we are expanding our capacity to prosecute online criminal harassment and abuse. Our 94 United States Attorney's offices across the country, with the support of our criminal division, are working in partnership with law enforcement at all levels to successfully prosecute these cases. Our OVW grant program supports specialized training for law enforcement partners to identify, investigate, and bring cyber stalking cases and provide survivor-centered services. And in the months ahead, the Justice Department will implement important provisions from VAWA aimed at improving our enforcement efforts. First, the FBI director will de design and create within the Uniform Crime Reports a category for offenses that constitute cyber crimes against individuals. We will publish an annual report on this information and all the information that we gather to further inform our enforcement efforts. In addition, the department will develop and implement a comprehensive strategy to reduce the incidence of these cyber crimes, to coordinate investigations of these cyber crimes by federal law enforcement agencies, to increase the number of federal prosecutions of these cyber crimes, and to develop an evaluation process that measures rates of cyber crime victimization and prosecutorial rates among tribal and culturally specific communities. Finally, we are expanding our capacity to protect and support the survivors of these crimes. The Office of Victims of Crime will award $3 million to victim services organizations through the Advancing the Use of Technology to Assist Victims of Crime program. 
This program will support initiatives that use technology to increase access to services and information about victims' rights, enhance service providers' understanding of technology-facilitated gender-based violence, and strengthen the responsiveness of victim service organizations supporting survivors of this type of violence. The experience of online criminal harassment and abuse are often much more than a single incident or moment in time. Online criminal harassment and abuse can be life-altering and sometimes life-shattering, which endures long after the crime has occurred. We are committed to relentlessly investigating these crimes, bringing to justice those who perpetrate them, and providing support for the survivors. Thank you all for your attention to the task. We look forward to our shared work in the days ahead. It's now my honor to introduce my fellow general, the Surgeon General of the United States.